film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths. It is all the more tragic in that they were young. But had they lived very, very long lives, they could not have expected. Nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon became a nightmare. For 30 years, the files collected dust in the Cold Cases Division of the Travis County Police Department. Over 1,300 pieces of evidence were collected from the crime scene at the Hewitt residence. Yet none of the evidence was more compelling than the classified police footage of the crime scene walkthrough. Test, test, test. Okay, uh, this is uh, August 20th, 1973. The time is uh, 3.47 p.m. A location is the Hewitt residence um, on Route 17. It's where victim one was found. Uh, we're gonna do a walkthrough and uh, we're now descending the stairs into the furnace room. Uh, there's over here, there's scratch marks along the wall. There's some more over here, along here. And, oh, there's something over here. Seems, looks like a clot of hair and a embedded finger now. All right, we're going to go move into the uh, actual furnace room. Watch yourself. This is the actual furnace room. Go on into where are they expected to be traded. Got a bit of a jump there. Come on back here. Follow me. Come on. <laughs> The crime scene was not properly secured by Travis County Police. Two investigating officers were fatally wounded that day. This is the only known image of Thomas Hewitt, the man they call Leatherface. The case today still remains open. The events of that day were to lead to one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the remake by Stephen Hand. Prologue. Okay, the tape's rolling. Let me just clear my throat. <clears throat> right, that's better. Here we go. August 2003. Hewitt case. There is something very wrong with the Lone Star State. Its deep heart is fibrillating. Only nobody wants to save the patient, least of all Texas itself. Not because no one cares, but because like any patient with a self-negating compulsive disorder, you can't begin to effect a cure until the sufferer first admits she's got a problem. And Texas doesn't have any problems, ask anyone. She's the biggest state outside of Alaska, and her natural resources are the blood and guts of the entire country. She produces more oil than any other state and provides most of the coal burned in America's power stations to produce electricity. She is one of the country's leaders in farming, earning over $5 billion from the sale of crops and vegetables. And for the sheer volume and diversity of ranching, Texas remains number one. Cattle, poultry, eggs, hogs, goats, sheep, wool, mohair, leather, 
Chances are, if you're eating or wearing something, it probably came from somewhere within the state's 268,000 square miles. Texas isn't just about refining raw material. When Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon in 1969, they'd traveled straight up from Houston. And last year, 68% of all international exports from Texas were in computer and electronic products, as well as chemicals and other industrial equipment and machinery. Texas has also invested heavily in the financial and service sectors, and has led all states in Internet job creation since 1990. The state also gave us two presidents. It was Dwight D. Eisenhower from Denison, Texas, who pushed the green light on the country's interstate highway system. Texas itself has over 77,000 miles of road, and its airline business remains one of the healthiest and most used in America, even after 9-11. Fighting in the face of adversity is what Texans do best. No state more than Texas is built upon the fierce tradition of liberty and independence that lies at the very core of American beliefs. Many people forget that when Sam Houston's forces routed the Mexican soldiers at San Jacinto, Texas entered into a nine-year period as an independent nation. And much later, when General Lee had already surrendered the Confederate cause at Appomattox a month previously, the last fight of the Civil War took place at Palmito Ranch, South Texas. Even today, Texas is the only state permitted by law to fly its flag at the same height as the Stars and Stripes. The cry, Remember the Alamo, is just uh, as relevant in today's global turmoil as it was when 190 men stood fast against an army of 5,000 and died so that you and I can be free. When Landry's Cowboys used to be called America's Team, it was more than cheap marketing, because to most Texans, Texas is America. But America has got problems. Here is a news bulletin from a CBC television news service. Here is a picture of President Kennedy and his wife taken just before he was shot today in Dallas, Texas. President Kennedy is reported to be fighting for his life in a Dallas hospital, but reports conflict. CBS says he is dead. Here is a picture of the president. You've seen the picture of the president just before his, uh, the, he was shot in the limousine uh, in Dallas, Texas. Mr. Kennedy was struck in the head. The governor of Texas, John Connolly, was shot in the back. It's reported the American Vice President, Lyndon Johnson, was also shot, but he is not in serious condition in an emergency operation. That was a bulletin from the CBC Television News Service. Ask some people about Texas, and they'll remember a day in Dallas, 1963, when the dreams of the entire Western world were shattered by a sniper's bullet. They'll also remember how it was a Texan, Lyndon B. Johnson, from Gillespie County, who was sworn in as president on the day of Kennedy's assassination. The same people might also tell you that the last time they saw pictures from Texas broadcast nightly on their TV was during the Waco siege of 1993. When a bungled joint operation by the FBI and the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms resulted in the violent deaths of 80 cult members, known as Branch Davidians, and their leader, David Koresh. The fact that Koresh just happened to set up shop in Texas might be considered unlucky, but what's not unlucky is the way extremist Texan militia groups have regarded Waco as an example of covert martial law being imposed on free-thinking, free-willed individuals by a corrupt Washington government that is variously depicted as homosexual, satanic, Jewish, Masonic, or all of these things combined. These same militiamen look back to San Jacinto and tell us we should take arms to defend our freedoms against a horde of politically correct perverts entrenched on Capitol Hill. And when the FBI declares these gun-wielding toy soldiers as domestic terrorists, the gunmen cry back, Remember the Alamo! Militia groups are not exclusive to Texas, nor are the Ku Klux Klan, who have at least five different factions in the state, and it might be unfair to single out the death of James Byrd Jr. as being in any way unique to Texas, even though the whole world was horrified to hear of that night in 1998 
when Bird was grabbed by three white men on a road outside Jasper, then tied up and dragged to his death behind a pickup truck. So this is the paradox to many people. Texas is a forward-thinking, proud, and powerful state, devoutly religious and welcoming to all visitors. After all, the name originates from the Hassanai Indian word, Tejas, meaning friend. To others, the state is a symbol of all things reactionary, violent, and primitive. Just as the state excels in productivity, it also is seen as excelling in macho violence, freakish subcultures, and racial hatred. The Texan redneck is renowned the world over as the ultimate stock cartoon of ill-mannered stupidity. Another way of understanding this contradiction is to log onto the website of the Texas Justice Department and look for the death row page. Now, whatever the rights and wrongs of the death penalty, and I'm against, it is utterly insane to misdirect the tools and promise of the information era to officially and dryly present a list of death row facts, including a page of final mill requests. That's right. You can log on to the Justice Department website and see what prisoners ate prior to their appointment with the executioner. This neat table of personal menus is made available on the Internet, solely to satisfy our morbid curiosity. We want to know if the myth of the famous last meal is true. Can convicts really eat anything they want before their lethal injection? This is what Texas is all about, myth versus reality. And this is why Texas is the perfect American state. It represents all our ideals and nightmares. It is the extreme condition of what America could or might be. It is a dystopia clashing with utopia. In some ways, the metaphor runs even deeper than this idea of Texas as America's psyche. It could be that Texas provides the perfect model for understanding, 21st century man himself. Mankind still has not made a decisive step towards civilization. Part of us still wants to fight and to hate. Part of us remains animal. Only most animals don't kill for pleasure or create a system of resource sharing that forces millions of their own kind into poverty and starvation. So when we look at Texas, we can see who we want to be and who we really are. But we cannot aim for greatness as long as we refuse to admit our failures. At the outset, I said that there was something very wrong in the Lone Star State. From what I've been talking about so far, you might think I was referring to some of the state's general problems, but I am not. What I'm talking about is the state's refusal to acknowledge its biggest failure in recent criminal history. I'm talking about how Texas can never embrace a better future as long as it tries to hide its sordid, unpleasant past. I'm talking about the darkest, dirtiest secret deep in the heart of Texas. At this point, I need to come clean and admit that I'm Texan and proud of it. I was born in Travis County, a few miles outside Abilene, where I went to school and majored in journalism. I then traveled around Texas, going wherever there was work. My first two jobs were on local newspapers, both down near San Antonio. Then in 1971, I got a position with a two-bit TV news outfit in Austin. I had a great time there. The company had no money. Everyone had to cover for everyone else. It was perfect for an enthusiastic young reporter like I was at the time. You see, we worked as a team, and we fairly much decided everything on a day-by-day -day basis. And that's how we managed to report on national, as well as local news. What we didn't have in budget, we made up for in energy. Back in the summer of 1973, there was only one real story, Nixon. On August 15th, President Richard Milhouse Nixon made his second address to the nation on the Watergate scandal. The speech was good, but as we all know now, not good enough. All the same, we were giving Watergate a lot of coverage. But on August 20th, that changed. 
One of my law enforcement sources called me in the middle of the afternoon. I'd just got back from a long lunch, and told me that a group of investigators had been dispatched to a remote farmhouse in Travis County. This, of course, was my home turf. I hurriedly scribbled down a few details, grabbed my crew, then got down there as fast as I could. A couple of newspaper guys had arrived before us, but we were the first broadcast people on the scene. We nailed our footage along before anyone else from TV or radio showed up. It was a big scoop for us that night. You might be able to remember the clip. I cringe each time I see it. I was so young and stupid then, looking back. If you recall, I was standing on the roadside trying to talk about the traffic. The road was usually empty, but a lot of local rubbernecks had turned out. Anyway, what I actually said was, Police recovered the remains of at least 33 murder victims at the home of Thomas Brown Hewitt, a former head skinner at a local slaughterhouse. It was terrible. We couldn't get close because the FBI had everywhere taped off. But we did learn that multiple locations were involved. We knew there were investigators up at a nearby farmhouse and some searching a local meat plant. And we even managed to grab some film of five agents inspecting a body lying face down in water at the bottom of a creek. Of course, we couldn't show it on air. We actually had decency rules back then. These days, they'd probably zoom the lens right up the victim's ass. At first, the whole picture was confused. It was clear that something horrible had happened, but the full extent of the crimes was being kept under wraps. There were also rumors that something had gone badly wrong during the opening of the investigation, which would have explained why all the authorities were being tight-lipped. The headline of the local evening newspaper that day read, House of Horror Stuns Nation, Massacre in Texas, and the strap line ran, Chainsaw Butcher Kills 33. And that was the first even I got to hear about the chainsaw. Late the next day, the police called a press conference. The hall was packed. Interest in the story was worldwide. Everyone wanted to know more about the insane chainsaw killer and his 33 victims. At first, it seemed as if everyone was going to get what they came for. Accompanied by a couple of men from the FBI... County Supervisor Franklin Nash came in and spelled out the basic facts. Number one. Following a call from a member of the public, police went to investigate the cause of a major disturbance at an isolated farmhouse near the town of Fuller. The name of the person who called the police was being withheld. Number two. Initial investigations led to the discovery of a number of dead bodies. The FBI were called out immediately, and a full investigation was set in motion. Number three. During the course of the investigation, two police officers were killed, Detective Adams and Officer Henderson. Both men were murdered by the sole suspect in the case. Number four. The murderer was a middle-aged man named Thomas Brown Hewitt, who had been killed by police while trying to escape arrest. Number five. All families of all the bereaved had been contacted. Number six. There were no other suspects in the case. Number seven. FBI agents had found one injured survivor who, regrettably, was medically unfit to assist the police any further. Number eight. The case was closed. And that was it. The most horrific crime of the 20th century, and that's all they were prepared to give us. I knew a couple of guys who'd been working the crime desk for over 30 years, and they said they'd seen nothing like it. There were no photos, no witness statements. There wasn't even an inquiry into the shooting of the main suspect. I asked Nash if he could give us more information about Hewitt or about how the two officers were killed, but he refused. He had a whole room of angry press demanding to know the name of the survivor, but all he would say was that discussing the incident further would be bad for Texas, whatever the hell that meant. It's times like that when you realize just how dependent news is on the cooperation of the authorities. The moment they stop playing ball, you have no material. And no material means no story. It's a lesson I've learned many times over the course of my career. To most people, the classic image of a journalist is of a determined young investigator who goes out and digs up all the facts. In reality, most journalists just take what they're given and reword it. Investigative journalism takes time, money, and contacts. 
and in Travis County, 1973, I had only one of the three vital ingredients needed to break the Hewitt case wide open. I asked my editor to let me make a news special on the murders, but he wasn't interested. He said that after Watergate, I was conspiracy crazy and couldn't think straight. Maybe he was right, but I couldn't let a story this big break on my doorstep and then just disappear. Wrong. The Hewitt Chainsaw murders were dead and buried within a month and forgotten by everyone except yours truly. I spent two years trying to get closer to the case, but I drew a complete blank. My normal contacts dried up. I couldn't get my hands on any paperwork. I even drove out there, but the cops kept the whole area out of bounds until they'd sanitized the place. The local police wouldn't talk either. Basically, I struck out, and when the frustration eventually got too much, I let go. Since then, the case has received barely a mention. Occasionally, you'll find a couple of vague paragraphs in one of the increasingly popular encyclopedias of homicide, but no one has come even close to writing the definitive version of what took place in Travis County, August 1973. Until now. Finally, 30 years after the murders took place, I can reveal all the facts behind the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, even though I suspect nobody cares anymore. In 1981, the state of Texas leveled the farmhouse and filled the basement with cement. The killings and the media frenzy had long stopped, and the police were only too happy to close this bizarre case forever. I quit my New York job in 1999. I'd make a new millennium's resolution to give up the 9-to-5 grind of office politics and try my hand at freelancing again. I'd gone freelance once before in the 80s, but it had gone expensively wrong. This time out of the gate, however, I walked straight in to a commission. A company specializing in the production of straight-to-video DVD documentaries wanted to make a film about the Hewitt case. The CEO of the company was a crime aficionado, and he actually owned a tape of my outside broadcast from that day in August 1973. He'd done some asking around, learned I had some unresolved interest in the case, and so approached me with a deal that I couldn't refuse. They wanted me to research and present the Hewitt program, and would even give me book rights for a cut of the royalties. So over 20 years after I'd left town, I found myself back in Austin thinking about those 33 dead people. I still had good contacts there, and after all this time, the authorities were more relaxed. The case was ancient history. Also, many of the people who were involved in the Hewitt investigation had either retired or moved on. Fortunately, improvements in freedom of information over the last few decades made it easier to gain access to official documentation. Compared to the frustration I'd felt in 1973, everything seemed almost too easy and I began to wonder why no one else had got there before me. But that was before I'd taken a closer look at the remaining evidence. The more I discovered about the Hewitt case, the less I knew. The first thing I had access to was the victim dossier. I got a full list of names and details. There were photos attached, family pictures, graduation portraits, lots of smiling, optimistic faces. But then I saw the scene of crime photos. The victims had been mutilated and butchered almost beyond recognition as human beings, and I began to understand why the county supervisor had acted the way he did. Even in our mass media age of 24-7 televised atrocities, some crimes are perhaps best left in the dark. I tried contacting some of the families of the victims, but no one wanted to talk. I was just stirring up too many painful memories. Nor was there much they could actually tell me. The police had told the relatives of the deceased nothing more than they told the public. In any event, my real target was Thomas Brown Hewitt. From the moment I first started my renewed investigation, I kept coming across a bizarre name, Leatherface. I later learned that this was a nickname given to Thomas Hewitt, but I didn't know where the name came from until I spoke to one of the attendants at the killer's autopsy. She told me Hewitt's body had been riddled with bullet holes, all of them inflicted by police firearms, 
but what really set her talking was the fact that Hewitt's corpse was wearing a leather face mask that turned out to be made of human skin. I asked if there were any photos of Hewitt's body at the crime scene, and she helped me locate a picture of Hewitt wearing the mask, sitting in an armchair. It was grotesque. He was clearly wearing a mask of some description, but the top of his head had been blown wide open. As revolting as the image was, there was something far more disturbing about it, something I couldn't put my finger on. So I checked my old file from 1973 and found what I was looking for. It was an old newspaper, local edition. The headline ran, Madman Gunned Down by Police. Texas House of Horrors Come to an End. The paper carried an interview with County Supervisor Nash, held at the funeral of Detective Tom Adams. Nash had spoken to the press to assure people that the detective's death had not been in vain. But I had to read the interview three times before the full implication of what the county supervisor had said fully sank in. I lost two guys down there, but we tracked the killer down, and while attempting to escape, Mr. Hewitt took a shotgun blast to the face, and that day the state of Texas won. But the damage on the picture I'd seen didn't look like it had been caused by a shotgun. The face in that repulsive mask was far too intact. Also, it seemed strange that Nash had said Hewitt had been caught trying to escape, because in the crime scene photo I had, Hewitt was clearly sitting in an armchair inside what looked like the Hewitt house. Clearly, I needed to talk with Franklin Nash, so I made an appointment to see him at his office, and if I was puzzled before, I was completely lost afterwards. Nash didn't really want to talk, and he wouldn't let us film it, but I made an audio recording of our brief conversation. Of course the case was closed, he said loudly. Anybody who tells you that we got the wrong man is mistaken. I was a senior officer. I can assure you that absolutely everything was handled completely by the book. Now, prior to him saying that, I never once suggested he'd got the wrong man. So clearly, there was more to this issue than even I was aware of. And then when Nash then showed me his scene of crime photo of Hewitt, I positively knew something was wrong. Nash's photo showed Hewitt sitting dead behind the wheel of an automobile. There was blood everywhere, and the corpse's face had been obliterated. So now I had seen two completely different photographs of Hewitt's body. Both originated from official sources, but their images and corpses contradicted each other. The moment I tried to question Nash about this, he terminated the interview. It was at this point that I decided to change my approach. The paper trail was becoming of increasingly questionable value, so I needed to get closer to the crime itself, and the only way to do that was to find someone who'd been on the ground. The duty roster for the time in question was pretty thorough, and after a week or so of intense phone calling, I managed to find Roger Church, retired police officer. When I met Church, it was evident that retirement had not been kind to him. I treated him to a bottle of bourbon and asked him to tell me everything he knew. Unfortunately, he didn't know that much. Church had been on court on duty, so didn't get to see any of the bodies or the events leading to the shooting of the main suspect. However, he did have some very strong opinions, which he said were based on conversations with his fellow officers, and he also had an amazing revelation to make. Yeah, we botched the case. Anybody with half a brain knew the crime scene wasn't sealed properly. There's a film in the Hall of Records you need to see. Shows the whole goddamn thing. The prospect of a previously undiscovered film showing anything from the Hewitt investigation was almost too unbelievable for words. I made immediate arrangements for a viewing at the Hall of Records, but had to wait an unbearable two weeks before finally meeting the clerk. I can't begin to describe how I felt when he dropped a dusty old 16 millimeter film can in front of me and said, I don't think this film's seen the light of day for over 30 years. 
I had no idea what I was about to see, but I felt like what Lord Carnarvon must have done when he first opened the tomb of Tutankhamun. The wait while the clerk spooled the film onto his old sign projector was torture. Then he pulled down a small white screen, turned down the lights, and switched on the machine. Detective Tom Adams stepped into frame in front of the entrance to a gloomy farmhouse. Okay, we're rolling, said an unseen officer holding the camera. This is uh, August 20th, 1973, Adams announced. Time is uh, 347. Location is the Hewitt property, the residence where victim one was found. I will now begin the walkthrough. There was a jump edit in the film, and the next sequence showed the camera descending down a concrete stairway with Adams out of shot. It was so dark that the camera was struggling for a picture. You could hear footsteps as they walked down the stairs, the detective continuing his narration off camera. We are descending stairs to the furnace room. I see scratch marks on both walls. On the western wall there is a brown stain with what appears to be a clot of hair and an embedded fingernail. The image then moved into the furnace room. A light flickered in the ceiling showing intermittent glimpses of madness. The whole room seemed to be a chaotic mess of bodies, tools, and objects that were hard to make sense of. There's something moving behind those shelves, whispered Adams. Southwest corner. Quickly, the camera turned and moved in the direction indicated by the detective. Suddenly, an arm swept into view, and the ceiling light went out, plunging the room and the picture into darkness. There was a scream. The cameraman. Something's just happened! came Adam's voice, followed by a dull thud and a series of hysterical cries. What was that? shouted Adams. What was that? Someone turned on a nightlight, and it was now possible to see that the camera was panning crazily in all directions, rendering the image almost useless. Adams spoke again off camera. Oh, oh my god! Then the sound cut and the camera turned to show Detective Adams lying on the ground stunned and bleeding, before the final image of someone wearing a leathery mask and waving an axe in one hand, lashing out at the camera. It cut to black. I had the film digitized and prints made from the last few horrifying frames. I had seen him, Thomas Hewitt, in action, and I found it hard to believe that this crucial piece of film showing the death of the two police officers had been left to rot in the county archives. This incredible, shocking footage would form the most important part of my DVD documentary, not only because of the powerful, terrifying images contained within it, but also because the appearance of Hewitt in this film was different from the two dead Hewitts I'd seen in the two crime scene photos. This was new evidence, evidence which suggested Hewitt had never been found. But that couldn't be right, could it? The only way I could be sure was to find the sole remaining survivor from the Hewitt attacks, the person mentioned in the Nash 73 public statement. Again, this proved surprisingly easy. For legal reasons, I am not currently permitted to identify the name or even the gender of the survivor. What I can say is that the survivor's age is uncertain, but is somewhere in the 50s or 60s. The survivor lost an arm as a result of an attack by Hewitt, and unfortunately the survivor has not spoken a single word since the day of the attack. Doctors describe the condition as near catatonia. However, the survivor is a compulsive eater of chocolates and candy, which helps explain the obesity. I showed the survivor an autopsy photo of the bullet-riddled body. They had a dead body with a mask, I said, and that was all they cared about. That was the end of their story. Do you remember anything? You haven't said a word since that day. Can you try to remember? I got no response, just a floor full of candy wrappers. But I hoped that if I showed the survivor a photograph of the real Leatherface, I might be able to trigger something. 
so I took out the prints I'd made from the film, those last images of the masked Hewitt waving an axe. If that horrifying image didn't get through, nothing would. Were you shown these police photographs? I asked. This is the only known footage of the man known as Leatherface. That's him, isn't it? The real one, I mean. Silence. I arranged to meet with retired Officer Church again, and found out he'd already approached the survivor with exactly the same idea. You know what I did, he chuckled. I snuck out some of the autopsy pictures and showed them to that survivor. I guess I shouldn't say that on your camera, huh? When I asked Church if the survivor spoke at all, his reply left me speechless. Why shouldn't she? He replied. After all, she was the one causing all the trouble, telling everyone we'd gotten the wrong guy. Church was talking about someone else, another survivor, a woman who'd been saying they'd killed the wrong man, confirming every suspicion I'd been feeling. Once more, I found myself struggling to comprehend the implications of yet another part of the police investigation that had been kept hidden from everyone. How was it possible that a second survivor could have remained out of the public eye for so long? The answer to that question came when Church gave me the woman's details. She was in her fifties and had conveniently spent most of her life inside a mental institution. Her name didn't appear on any of the initial police reports because she hadn't been anywhere near the Hewitt place when the FBI broke in. She'd turned up a week or so later at a police station a few hundred miles away. It was the FBI who'd made the connection, so the woman never appeared on Travis County Police records. She said she'd been at the farmhouse on August 18th and had escaped the following day. At first, there was some doubt as to her reliability as a witness, but a plate check on an abandoned vehicle found near the farmhouse positively linked the woman to the crime scene. So within three days of supposedly meeting the only living survivor of the Hewitt murders, I was going to meet a second, and the woman was prepared to appear on camera. In fact, she almost seemed relieved that I was there, as if a long burden was about to be lifted from her shoulders. At first, her manner was shy and reserved, but I took my time and slowly we began to talk. I decided to open the conversation with a discussion of my reservations about the way the police had conducted the case, something to which she readily agreed. After police interviewed me about what had happened, she said, one officer admitted things were mishandled from the beginning. I let her talk about this for a while before gently asking her if she could tell me what had happened in August 1973, but she shook her head and looked at the floor, so I changed the subject and asked her if she could remember being visited by Officer Church. Could she remember him showing her any photos of the body in the morgue? When she answered me, she began slowly, but then, almost as if I had unlocked something in her mind, the rest just started to pour out, and before I knew it, the disheveled woman was telling me her story. Yeah, I saw the autopsy photos. I guess he was trying to make me feel like it was all over. Closure. But it wasn't him. I know he's still out there. I never sleep through the night. I remember it all. It was terrible. A terribly hot day. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been the prologue of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the novelization of the remake by Stephen Hand. Uh, this one's going to be a fun one. I really enjoyed the prologue. Uh, you know, getting in the head of an investigative reporter that was, uh, you know, a young gun reporter back when it went down and has, you know, been interested in it and all the stuff that had been, like, uh, 
kept out of the news and kept secrets and hush hush. And I like the idea that this book, this novelization, is him meeting with the survivor and her telling him the story. I like how that starts. Um, I really enjoyed uh, this prologue of him tracking down all the evidence, tracking down the surviving people, finding out that Leatherface could still be out there, is still out there. Um, it, it was it was a really cool prologue. I gotta say, very imaginative and creative. Um, a cool way to kick this book off, I think. Uh, let me know what you all thought of the prologue, if you enjoyed the way they kicked off the book. If you're looking forward to this one like I am. Uh, we have a lot of patrons doing voices in this book. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'll be back very soon with the first chapter of this book. And uh, I think it's going to be a wild ride. Uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is coming. So uh, I'm excited. Hope you are too. Until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying thanks for listening, be excellent to each other, and I'll see you. Did you jump? You jumped, didn't you? <laughs> I'm sorry. But in my defense, it is a slasher horror channel, right? So I gotta throw some real scares in there too, right? Sometimes. Have a good night, everybody.